This is David Swanson sending greetings to the Resistance International Film Festival in Iran. Thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry I could not come. I am busy these same days with a conference in Washington, D.C., organized by World Beyond War, and I encourage you in the coming days or weeks to check out the videos at worldbeyondwar.org. We are trying to do just what you asked me to speak about here, and that is to build a bigger and broader and more powerful and more international and more global peace movement, movement against war, movement for the total abolition of war. Uh, and we seem to be having some success. I'm speaking before this big conference, but the interest has been overwhelming. We've had to turn away many, many speakers and many, many would-be participants, and we are live streaming and recording the video so that we can reach as many people as possible, and we're organizing activist workshops on the third day of the conference this coming Sunday, and a big protest at the Pentagon uh, of War on Monday morning, September 26th at 9 a.m. So we're looking forward to seeing how all of that goes. Um, the situation in the United States, as you may be more or less aware, is in some ways pretty grim in terms of war. Uh, just about everyone in power in Washington, D.C. totally accepts permanent war permanent, incredible military spending, roughly a trillion dollars a year across numerous departments just from the United States, and then, of course, the United States arms industry serving as the top supplier of weapons to other countries around the world with all sorts of governments, uh, many of those weapons sold, others of them given free. Uh, but arms dealer to the world and arms purchaser extraordinaire, top purveyor of violence, on the globe, as Dr. Martin Luther King once said, this is the United States government and, of course, many other governments around the globe uh, engaging in outrageously high military spending uh, and war preparations and war provocations rather than disarmament, dip diplomacy, aid, and restitution for past wars. Uh, the, the need is incredible at this point to shift are thinking, and there are some positive indications in that direction, that after 15 years of permanent war through multiple uh, administrations and congresses and party leadership in Washington, many, many people outside of power, ordinary people, are sick and tired of war and are fed up with the justifications and excuses and want to end all of the wars now. Uh, you know, a long ways to go, but if we had direct democracy in the United States, the, the weapon sale going through Congress right now to Saudi Arabia would be stopped, as would weapon sales to every other country. Uh, weapons uh, gifts to Israel and other countries would be stopped, and much would be shifted from U.S. military spending to human needs and environmental protection. Th this is the number way in which the United States government kills people. It's not through war, it's not through any weapon, it's through the spending. Because a trillion dollars on war could totally transform the world if spent otherwise. Tens of billions could end starvation globally, could provide clean drinking water everywhere. Uh, you know, the, what could be done in terms of medicine and education and housing and sustainable agriculture, you know, is just unfathomable. But that money keeps flowing and it's still unquestioned. Uh, the, the power, the rise, the sustained uh, power of Jeremy Corbyn in the United Kingdom should be encouraging to those of us in every other country, uh, but we don't have uh, a Jeremy Corbyn in power in the United States yet. That's something, something for us to be working on. Uh, the, the situation in the United States it has two sides, including in relation to Iran. Uh, most people are encouraged and happy that a nuclear agreement was reached between the United States and Iran and other nations rather than a war being started because this was how the debate was framed in the United States Congress between an agreement and war. Uh, and yet both sides of that debate in the United States pushed falsehoods about Iran. One side said we must have a nuclear agreement because those Iranians are, are so malevolent and untrustworthy and pursuing nuclear weapons and have a nuclear weapons program, uh, and so we must have this agreement. 
And the other side said, because the Iranians are so evil and hell-bent on developing nuclear weapons, we must not have this agreement and go to war. So whichever, whichever position was being promoted, and I'm glad the better one succeeded, the same lies were being pushed by both sides. And you now have a U.S. public convinced that Iran has been pursuing nuclear weapons. Meanwhile, a U.S. whistleblower, Jeffrey Sterling, who revealed, uh, tried to reveal to Congress and allegedly revealed through the media that the CIA was trying to give nuclear blueprints and parts to Iran, uh, he's in prison and apparently has just had a heart attack and is being denied basic health care while in prison. And most Americans don't know his name. Uh, they do know, however, the name of Donald Trump, who is talking uh, quite threateningly about war with Iran because Iran held for some moments a U.S. ship that was in Iranian waters, uh, as if the United States wouldn't have done the same uh, or worse with an Iranian ship in U.S. waters. Uh, so this is the ugly sort of politics in the United States at the moment. But off the radar screen, on the internet, on live streamed video and recordings and independent media and international media and through activist organizations, there is another side to U.S. public opinion. There is the side of the people who prefer peace, prefer diplomacy, want to learn the truth, want reconciliation, want restitution, want aid and diplomacy and cooperation as if the United States is one nation among others rather than a dominant force on the globe. Uh, and we are working to make our voices better heard. Of course, your conference is about film, which is one of the most powerful media there is uh, and has incredible potential and is sometimes put to very good use uh, with very low budgets. It's an extremely expensive medium to succeed with, especially in the United States, where the films that get shown in the big theaters usually have incredibly enormous budgets. Uh, there's a small low-budget film about the peace movement in the United States right now uh, touring in small theaters called Paying the Price for Peace, uh, and I recommend searching that out and watching it on the internet. Uh, there is in big theaters right now a film called Snowden, uh, that I think is the best film of the year and does a very good job, but is focused primarily on surveillance and spying, uh, not on warfare, although it touches on killing and drone killing. Uh, but one wonders, where is the Manning movie? Where is the Chelsea Manning movie? Where are the movies about war whistleblowers, not just surveillance whistleblowers? Uh, these have to be made, and we'll have a more difficult time reaching an audience than Snowden. Uh, there have been dozens, literally dozens, of wonderful films and documentaries and theater stage play scripts and performances about drones in the past couple of years. Uh, any number of these movies making a, a powerful tool for explaining to people the immorality, the illegality, the impracticality of murdering people with missiles from drones. Uh, but none of them have had the huge budget and the success of the more propagandistic pro-drone murder movie called Eye in the Sky, which depicts itself and thinks of itself as uh, you know, a questioning uh, moral dilemma, but in fact presents a fantasy in which uh, the United States government has identified people, knows them, knows their biographies, their histories, literally cannot capture them, uh, has observed that they are actually an imminent threat to someone, not to the United States of America, as required by President Obama's self-imposed rules for drone murders, but still an imminent threat to people. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, this is a fantasy for a drone strike uh, that Americans imagine is the reality. I mean, people around the world should understand this, that Americans imagine that as their president says, no innocents die, only the guilty are, you know, <laughs> tried, sentenced, and convicted and executed by the drone missile. The, they are not available to be arrested you know, or captured, as it's said, as if they're wild animals, uh, and that 
that only uh, only in these situations and when the victim is a imminent threat to the United States, then is a missile used from a drone. All of which is false. You know, not a single known instance where a single one of these criteria has been met. But were they all met, there would be nothing legal or acceptable or moral or practical about it. Uh, and yet people go and watch a movie like Eye in the Sky. Uh, you know, and as Chomsky fam famously said, when you convince people that there's a vigorous questioning debate going on, but within certain boundaries, so that unacceptable opinions are not within the debate, well, then they don't question. Uh, and so people go and see a movie like that, and they think they're questioning drone murders, and they aren't. And they're buying into a fantasy that's going to prolong them. This is the power of film. This is the power of television and propaganda. Uh, about a year and a half ago, the Gallup polling industry polled in 65 countries and asked people what nation is the greatest threat to peace in the world. And overwhelmingly, in the majority of countries, the winner was the United States. But within the United States, the winner was Iran. Iran, which literally hasn't attacked another country in centuries, uh, has a budget less than 1% of the United States for its military, hasn't threatened anyone, isn't saying all options are on the table, or building new nuclear weapons, or stationing new missile bases uh, in more countries, or anything of the sort, is the number one threat to peace in the world, according to Americans. This is the power of video news. Uh, you know, and by the way, the new missile defense, as they're called, bases in Romania and Poland, uh, you know, are, are really not being promoted much anymore as a defense against Iran, uh, simply because no one, you know, even in the United States anymore, will believe it. Uh, so that's one positive bit in terms of U.S.-Iranian relations. Uh, the downside is that the U.S. government has become fairly open about the fact that all of its buildup in Eastern Europe is directed at Russia. And that could be worse for all of us than if they were talking about it as a, as a buildup against Iran. Um, the, uh, the, the, the thing that I think we need with films, the thing that I think the medium of film could do and isn't doing enough of, uh, is to provide... Americans and Westerners, that is U.S. residents and Europeans, uh, with the perspectives of others, particularly in the United States, U.S. films, U.S. television, U.S. newspapers, almost avoid the perspective of 96% of humanity. And so if you can produce high quality, in a Hollywood sense, expensive films with love stories and happy endings and the rest of it and the English language. Uh, but from the point of view of sympathetic people from Iran, from Russia, from China, from Pakistan, from Yemen, Somalia, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Palestine, uh, the rest of the world, provide these stories so that people in the United States can quote unquote humanize those characters. You know, as if we had some sort of doubt they were human until they were humanized. But if we can go through that process, uh, that seems to me the most powerful thing that film could accomplish. And, and there are examples of it doing it, but we need more of them. Wish I could be with you. Uh, good luck in any endeavors uh, you put underway for peace, nonviolence, brotherhood, friendship, diplomacy, and cooperation on this Little Planet.